Welcome to the fifth of our Cavisham Lectures. Dr. Nicola Hugo Cregan is a friend and she's been very good to me over the years, a quite a patron in uh, advancing my interests in, in the cause of systematic theology. When I first met her, she was um, teaching at um, BCNZ in West Auckland and she done her doctorate in Frederick, on Frederick Schleiermacher, the great liberal Protestant theologian of the 19th century. But as her, her career has advanced, yeah, yes, and, and the career has advanced, she's become very interested in the intersection between science and religion, and also very interested in um, the sentient creation and God's relationship to that. For much of theology's history, it's been human beings have been front and centre, and one of the great things about the last 100 years or so is that theologians have now become interested in the whole of the creative world and it's been drawn back to God, and the animal creation in particular. I want to reassure you that I've eaten nothing but vegetarian food today. <laughs> so um, no animals have had pain inflicted on them. But that is an issue too, really, that we rely a great deal of the suffering of the, of the animal kingdom to sustain our lifestyle. And um, it's the whole issue of our relationship to the animal creation that's going to be the subject of our lecture this evening, as I understand. Yes. Yes. I have been <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you for coming out. It's such a cold, windy, um, rainy night. I should say, she's, she's, a, Christmas. Yeah, she's teaching a course on science and religion at um, Otago right now as part of a summer school program. And that's how I go back to all more than seven years. Anyway, yes. Um, so if you have any questions, do just ask me. I know you'll be used to lots of theological language when you've got human as your as your priest, but um, if I'm not making sense, just, just let me know. So I've been teaching this course on science and theology, so my head is a little bit you know, um, whirling around. So I hope this is what you, you want to hear. Um, I'm going to talk about evolution, theology, and animals, and I'm going to start by, um, oh, turn it off. Ah, does everyone know what that is? This is one of these um, paintings from the Chabot cave, cave in southern France from about 28,000 years ago. So this is the first sort of evidence we have of, of some symbolic representation by our ancestors, which is pretty exciting. And what do they do? They, they, um, they paint animals. There's almost all animals on these caves, the odd hand and things like that. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. Um, but by the time we get to the Middle Ages, what do we start painting? There aren't any animals in sight. It's all the drama of salvation. It's the last judgment, in fact. It's who's saved and who isn't saved and their fate. It would be very different, so you can see that human beings have started thinking about very different things. I know there's a very big jump to be talking about, but I think it's, it's, um, it does sort of give us some sort of indication of what's happened in that time. Um, so what's happened in Christian theology for a number of reasons, and this is very hard to prove, I know, but it's um, I think, anyway, has made us anthropocentric. It's made us concerned with human beings at the extent of animals. Now it's probably the case that human beings are somewhat anthropocentric anyway, and that it's possible that elephants are elephant-centric and lions are lion-centric, so that's not very surprising. But I think that the way we think, because we're such symbolic um, creatures, does influence also um, our attitude to the rest of the world. And you can see that we went from thinking, oh, this is this interesting animal, to thinking there, there's the drama of salvation. So animals are in fact creation. Um, um, are eclipsed by the drama of salvation. And in fact, even the drama of which humans will be saved and which aren't. So we're busy, you know, in the late Middle Ages and for many, many centuries after that, wondering about who's going to be saved and who isn't. We're not really thinking about animals. Um, but now, of course, we're going through a prolonged period in which anthropocentrism is being challenged. And even as we've entered the age, which is called the Anthropocene, which is a geological age in which we think that um, human beings are the primary agents of change in the, 
on a plant. Um, so, the ecological crisis. Um, Lynn White Jr. Um, in 1967, 50 years ago, about, wrote a, a paper, The Historical Roots of the Ecological Crisis. And in that paper, he blamed Christians for the ecological crisis. He said he made a link between how we think about ourselves, religion, and how we relate to nature. So again, he's sort of saying there's a link there, but um, one influence the other. He says the victory of Christianity over paganism was the greatest psychological revolution in the history of our culture. Nature was no longer defended by spirits. So he, he's arguing as a historian that when Christianity took over from paganism, um, Christianity sort of banished the idea of all of the rocks and stones and plants and animals being defended by their own spirit. Um, and that made nature very vulnerable to our using it however we wanted. Um, and then very often nature was seen and, and it was valued for its symbolic value only. So for example, ants might be valued because they are wonderfully industrious creatures and you can use them in a sermon to show up you know, lazy people. And so that's the way in which um, nature was often used in, in, in Christian history. Um, but it's um, theologies of fall have probably had one of the biggest effects on the way in which we relate to the natural world. Um, and theology of the, Christian theology of the fall stems almost entirely from Genesis 3. And because you were born in church, I don't have to tell you what Genesis 3 is. But when I was teaching 80 students, I had to. Um, um, so never has so much been taken from, from one chapter of the Bible. Jewish writers are strangely silent on Genesis 3. Um, as is the rest of the, of the Hebrew Bible. But the Christian interest in, in um, Genesis 3 is because Paul takes up Genesis 3 and he draws analogies between Adam and Christ. So, for example, 1 Corinthians 15, 2, for all, as all die in Adam, so will all be um, made alive in Christ. And then in Romans, again, he says, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. And consequently, just as our tre one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. So, in this way, the story in Genesis 3 of the temptation by the serpent and the human giving in to this temptation has become a, an extremely pivotal story in Christian theology. And what did Paul do? Um, in Christian theology, it did a very lot of heavy lifting. It should be heavy lifting, not heavy lifting. <laughs> 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 Sorry about that. Um, um, humans took upon themselves um, the reason for all evil. So in the past, one could say, you know, why did somebody get disease? Why was there an earthquake? Why was there a tsunami? Why was there of war, and it all had to do with the fact that Adam and Eve fell and brought all the sin and destruction into the world. So in this story of the fall, human beings started um, relating to Genesis 3 and explaining all evil in this way. But it was done at the expense of our connection to animals, because the more we entered into the story of fall and redemption, the more we actually ignored the animals world because it was not so important. It was peripheral to the major story, which is the story of how we fell from perfection and and how we get back into heaven through through the story of salvation. And this was further ingrained by Archbishop of Canterbury, Anselm, in the 11th century who wrote, Cure Deus, I don't know, why did God become man? And by that he meant men and women. I mean, man, maybe become a man, become, become human. So the answer that, that Anselm gave was, drawing on the medieval honor system, was that because humans had offended God infinitely through Adam, and, and only an infinite compensation would suffice to bring us back into relationship to God, 
but only a compensation from humanity would suffice because it was human beings who, who um, offended God in the first place. Therefore, only God can pay an infinite price, and therefore God must become a human to pay the infinite price on our behalf. And so we get the penal theory of the atonement, um, which, which then sort of morphed into much more of a, um, of a, of a theology of our owing an infinite debt to God, and Christ came along to pay this infinite debt back to God the Father. So all of this emphasized, again, the, the story of the fall, and the story of redemption, and Christ coming as a human being, and not a donkey, in order to make up for the, the wrong that came into the universe through Adam and Eve, and the reformers, and Many theologians afterwards took up this, this um, penal theory of the atonement as well. So this is what we mean by a metaphysical fall. A metaphysical fall and the whole idea of original sin means that in this original story, which was taken literally or semi-literally, the fall of humanity changed the structures of life on earth and opened us up to opened up all life to disease, sin, suffering and death for animals and humans and in fact the whole ecosystem. Now this of course, this story is clearly not consistent with evolution. And evolution therefore challenges or seems to challenge the deep heart of Christian theology which has relates so much back to this whole idea of fall and redemption. But the other thing that this does, that the, this um, story of fall and redemption does, is that, is that it makes the fall, um, or the fall also makes redemption God's plan B. So, you know, Genesis 1 and 2 is how God intended everything to be and to proceed from there, and then along comes Genesis 3 and God's got to change God's plan. Um, so it separates redemption from creation, which is also not being both the ecosystem. So, evolution has challenged uh, some of our most ingrained theologies because it, it challenges the fall. Evolution asserts very slow, gradual change. For example, human beings make their way from being mammals to primates to hominins to humans. I mean, they're still mammals, of course. Um, but over very, very um, many, many millions of years. And we don't know where the threshold happened where we suddenly became human. Um, and we don't even know if it all happened in one place. But we know that somewhere in the last million years, probably more like 100 or 200,000 years ago, um, human beings crossed that threshold so that they had minds that are like ours today. But before humans were along, I mean, if you think of, if you think of the whole of life on Earth as starting at the 1st of January and going to the 31st of December, then human beings appeared only in the last 10 seconds of the 31st of December. So human beings have not been around very long, given the whole time span of life on Earth. And before humans were around, there was lots of suffering, lots of death, lots of very cruel predation going on, lots of mimetic rivalry, or, you know, just that's not. Oh, that's just being jealous of me. <laughs> Chimpanzees do it very well. And, um, um, and extinction. They all existed long before human beings came along. And so obviously human beings are not the cause of all of these things. And yet the Christian story has been built around this sort of idea of fall and redemption and everything really that's wrong with the world um, going back to this idea of fall. So you can see that this is sort of a, um, a contradiction here. And this challenges any semi-literal theology of the fall. And it asserts, um, the, the theory of evolution asserts the radical continuities between humans and other animals, as well, of course, as the, the idea that there was a threshold passed into humanity. But more than anything else, evolution asserts the continuities between us and other animals. <coughs> So in summary, the whole idea of a metaphysical fall, which is reinforced by New Testament writings, and further still by Anselm, 
became a very powerful story of debt and payment, which has been widely critiqued in recent decades because of its violence, in fact. But it also drew a very hard line between humanity and the whole of the rest of creation. Because while we were obsessed with human salvation, we forgot about the rest of the planet. Because really all that mattered was the humans were being saved. And it gave us more excuse for our hard dominion over our animals, because they ultimately didn't matter. Only human salvation mattered. And the theory of the fall um, also became the ultimate explanation for evil. So once we that was undermined, we also had a much bigger problem of evil. So evolution has opened up the whole problem of evil as well as everything else. And then you have Genesis 1 and 2, which is also somewhat problematic. Um, so not only is the hard definition of Genesis 3 a problem, but so is Genesis 1 and 2. Because all the way through Genesis 1 and 2, even if you take it in a perfectly symbolic and, and mythical way, it keeps saying, and it was good. And yet what was, what was good about it? Well, there was an awful lot that was good. There's an awful lot about good, of goodness in, in um the whole of life on Earth and its amazing vulnerability and the way in which it <coughs> has worked over all these years. But there was an also a lot, a lot of things that weren't good, like disease, like death, like extinction, like cruel predation, etc. Um, so how on Earth did the first few chapters of Genesis, where it was all good, in fact get to Genesis 3, where everything went wrong? And the whole idea of everything being good in Genesis 1 and 2 is the part of the mythical story which we really do need to grapple with. Because even though it's mythical, and even though it's um, symbolic, it does keep saying this thing about everything being good. So what on earth can that mean? And in what, in, in, in what sense did God create, only to have to turn around and redeem as plan B in Genesis 3? Um, so, one of the responses is that, um, to this is to say um, that redemption and creation, perhaps they're just two sides of the same coin. Perhaps that makes much more sense. Perhaps it makes more sense to say that, that um, Genesis 3 wasn't plan B, but in fact it was part of the natural order of things. It was how evolution was going to go. And that God always intended that everything would be good in the end. And that perhaps creation, as creation is about the whole of um, the natural world, that redemption too must be about the whole of the natural world. But here I am jumping ahead of myself. This is the picture that we are interacting with. The whole idea of temptation in the garden, um, expulsion from Eden, death, sin, disease, suffering, and then Christ pays the price of Adam's sin, and therefore ours, and overcomes death and disease and suffering. So this is the big picture that has gotten in the way of our interacting with an evolutionary understanding of the world, and has undermined our interaction with animals. The philosopher Wittgenstein said, um, a picture has held us captive, and we could not get outside it, for it lay in our language, and language seemed to repeat it to us inexorably. And I think that we can certainly apply this quote to the whole picture of fall and redemption as they have worked their way into Christian theology. Even with people who say, of course I believe in the theory of evolution, but still the whole idea of fall and redemption, as according to that picture, is often nevertheless portrayed. You see it in liturgies, you see it coming out in all sorts of places. And it's the reason for this picture, our uh, deep anthropomorphism, the way in which we see the whole world in terms of ourselves, especially perhaps if we're Christian, because non-Christians are not worrying about the whole drama of salvation. And in this story, only humans matter, salvation is for humans alone, and the whole story is about us. The other reason, of course, that 
we tend to be anthropomorphic as Christians is the whole theory, um, the doctrine of Amago Day. And again, Lynn White Jr., the one who wrote the article blaming Christians for the ecological crisis, he was a Christian himself. He said, man shares in great measure God's transcendence of nature. Christianity, in absolute contrast to ancient paganism and Asia's religions, not only established a dualism of man and nature, but also insisted that it is God's will that man exploit nature for his own profit ends. Now, people have been debating that ever, ever since Lynn White Jr. wrote this 50 years ago, and whether this is really the case. But, to some extent, we have to argue that the whole idea that we have dominion, um, that would be made in the image of God, therefore we're much closer to God than we are to the animals, has got to have an effect on us. And it's got to have an effect on how, much, how seriously we take the animals. So there must be some great truth, I think, in what he says. So, to summarize, we've become particularly anthropomorphic, partly because of our theology of Imago Dei, partly because of the separation of creation and redemption, partly because of the metaphysical fall, and the extreme emphasis on the salvation of humans, and the demarcation of humans even into those who are saved and those who are not. So all of these reasons which come out of this primal story of fallen and redemption, all of these make us more anthropomorphic, don't help us to take animals into consideration, especially theologically into consideration. I'm just going to stop here for a minute and ask you whether I'm going too fast or whether you're going to question. Yeah, you're doing fine. Right? Okay. Anyone else got questions? Okay. Right. So, um, Christians um, in the last 50 years have responded to Lynn White Jr. In, in three different ways. There have been apologists who say Christianity has always defended the creation. It's not true that we are responsible for being mean to animals. Um, Reconstructionists who say, yes, indeed, Christianity has been totally flawed and we must rebuild entirely in a perhaps, you know, humblest or whatever. And then there are revisionists who think that, yes, Christianity has erred, but mostly in the past unthinkingly, and it is now our task to save the planet. So theology and practice must be reimagined. And so that's really where a lot of our eco theology has come from in the last 50 years has been this re revisioning of Christian theology um, because of critiques like that of Lynn White Jr. So, what happens then when we return to the text with new eyes and with evolutionary and non-anthropomorphic eyes, when we start thinking about the animals and about the earth? Well, first of all, there are a lot of ways in which the fall can be reinterpreted, in which Genesis 3 can be reinterpreted. So, for example, Celia Dean Drummond, who is a very well-known eco-theologian, she says this shadow in other, you know, the things that are not completely right in other animal life is anticipatory of what happens in the fall, and therefore the fall should not be viewed as providing an explanatory account of natural evil, as if there were no such evil before a human fall. The rise and fall of humanity should not be seen in detachment from other creatures, but in association and even in entanglement with them. But she's very big on the whole idea of humans being entangled with other creatures. And David Clark, who's written a book on systematic theology on animals, he says, it's all about us theologies are at least insufficient, if not plain heretical, and we need to reject these in favor of an account that sees the end of creation as its participation in the triune life of God. In other words, instead of seeing that great big drama where one lot of people are damned and one lot of people go to heaven, instead we should be thinking about the whole of the creation being drawn into the salvation story, including all the animals. All the bits of the creation that we have ignored now. And to do this, we need to think, instead of thinking of salvation as plan B and just for humans, we need to think that salvation and creation are two sides of the same coin. They're both the work of God 
I'll go and work with God in the world um, and not just one um, plan B coming coming as an afterthought. So David Clough, for example, says for Christian doctrine to be coherent, we cannot afford for creation, reconciliation and redemption to be disjoint, but instead must see them together as different aspects of a single divine act of graciousness like God. In fact, if we look at biblical passages like Colossians 1, 15 to 19, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. In Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. All things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. For God is pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him. Well, this is one of the key passages that's used in eco-theology because it makes such profound connections between the Creator, Christ, um, and you see shadows of that in the Old Testament and in the wisdom literature, and, and the Redeemer, Christ. So the create, Christ is both Redeemer and Creator, which then makes sense of the whole idea that, that redemption and creation are in fact two sides of the same thing. And there are many instances in the scriptures where, in fact, if we go back with new eyes, um, suspicious of what we were thinking before, and look at the salvation story, we see that, in fact, all flesh and animals are everywhere in the scripture. So in Genesis, we're told that all creatures are good in the beginning and all are given plants to eat. In Genesis 2, both animals and humans are called Nefesh Haya, the breath of life. The covenant with Noah was with all flesh and not just with humans. In Exodus 13, it's the firstborn of every womb which is dedicated to God, both animals and the domestic animals and humans. In Exodus 12, the angel of death. Um, it, kills both the, first, the firstborn males of both animals and humans if they're not covered with blood. In Psalm 36, we hear that you save humans and animals alike, O Lord. And in Psalm 65, all flesh shall come to God and praise. We hear about God of all flesh in Jeremiah. In Isaiah in 65, we get the peaceable kingdom, the idea of the wolf lying down with the lamb and the lion eating straw. So in other words, the vision of the of the restoration is of, of, is of an animal kingdom at peace. In John 17, um, we hear you have given him authority over all flesh. In Romans 8, the whole earth is groaning as it awaits its redemption, redemption. And in Ephesians 1, we hear about reconciling and gathering up all things. Jesus was born amongst a whole lot of animals. He went out into the wilderness and communed with wild animals um, when he was being tempted. Um, he died as the Lamb of God. So if we start looking at the scriptures, we start seeing all of these signs that in fact, the whole of creation was a part of the story all along, but we were just ignoring it because we were being anthropocentric. And um, some of you may have um, read some feminist theology, and in feminist theology, the idea is that you go to the scriptures and you read wondering where all the women are and what they're doing and why they're not being named, and etc. etc. Um, so you look at scriptures with the eyes of women. Well, it's the same with eco theology, you look at the, at the scriptures with the eyes of the earth and, and all creatures. And in fact, there's even a green Bible. Can you see the green Bible? Um, it's meant to have all the earth-related things colored green. And instead of, you know, like a red Bible where you call the, all the words of Jesus colored red. So. They don't get quite right, but that's right. So, we, there's always another way of reading all this. So we can do theology, um, talk about creation and even the fall, taking an evolutionary perspective, taking the perspective of the animals and the creation, um, into consideration. And by the same token, we can talk about evolution, continuity, and distinction, and 
having a theological point of view in mind as well. So for example, we can say humans are part of the creation. Um, we weren't given a special day of creation. We were made along with the animals. And, and even in our distinctiveness, um, this, you know, in being named Imago Dei, made in the image of God, what is the point of that? Well, it's in order that we should have some sort of connection with the natural world, um, to have dominion. Um, very early, Christian commentators and theologians started talking about the law of God, um, discernible in the creation. In the Old Testament, we hear about wisdom being a part of God almost, and the, and the way in which the, the creation was made. Um, and the creation declares the glory of God. The fall has been reimagined in lots of different ways. But we can think about humans and the fact that we did reach some sort of transition, some sort of threshold, and that we uniquely have a form of intelligence and cognitive fluidity and dexterity, and that uniquely we are able to change the world and to cooperate with evil as well as good. Um, and we can see that as both a fall upwards and a fall downwards. Certainly we have impacted with the um, natural world in a way that no other animal has. And the incarnation, if we think about it in the evolutionary perspective, can also be seen as redemption. An incarnation as taking on all flesh, not just humanity, but the whole of flesh, everything. And if we talk about the evolutionary story, we can talk about gradual change, but that there are thresholds are passed at various points. And if we look at our genetic heritage, we can see that we carry our genetic history and our genes. That many of the genes that are turned off in us are genes that were present in other animals, like the, like the gene to make vitamin C, for example, we have the deformed, that deformed gene in us. Um, we don't have completely different genetic material from other animals. Um, it's just rearranged differently. We de developed um, in complex niches full of other animals. Um, and our distinctiveness is in language and perhaps an advanced theory of mind and our dexterity. And these distinctiveness Distinctions have led to prodigious self-consciousness and religion and ability to make and use tools and again to cooperate for both good and evil. So it's possible to tell a theological story and the evolutionary story bearing in mind the other, um, the other story. And it's possible to tell them both, keeping in mind the depth of our evolutionary heritage and our connection to all the other animals on Earth. Incarnation, Catherine Tanner, for example, said, by assuming human nature and all its embodied connectedness and embeddedness in its physical surroundings, the word in Christ joins the human as well as the natural world of God. So in other words, Christ comes and is connected not only to us, but to everything that we're connected to, which is the whole of the natural world. So if we're going back and looking at animals and thinking about them, um, we might ask, well, do animals sin? And you probably know that in the 10th century and following in, in parts of Western Europe, they actually did put animals on trial. And um, then they executed them if they were being too bad. And even weevils were put on trial. And um, seems rather extraordinary now. but. Um, but then you have to think about what we do with sharks that eat people. We actually often do go after them, so perhaps it isn't quite so bizarre after all. But so it hasn't been completely unknown, the idea that animals sin. But, um, and of course we don't know whether animals sin, and whether it's even a sensible thing to ask. But because animals are on the theological agenda at the moment, because they're thinking about them theologically, it is an obvious question. Are they able to sin? Many animals have very complex higher intelligences. 
we really are only beginning to understand how extraordinary their intelligence are, both especially primates, crows, parrots, elephants, and dolphins, as well as dogs, of course, and cats. So all of these, and wolves, I mean, all have very complex high, higher intelligences, and we don't know what they're saying to each other. And we don't know exactly what their form of awareness is. Some animals seem to be very deliberate in what they're doing. But if sin is just missing the mark, then, an then animals can certainly sin. And if we think about human sin, that much human sin is, is unconscious. So if we think about, you know, in the prayer book, we talk about sinning, um, Yes, but the whole idea is that um, we're asking for forgiveness for the things that we've done deliberately, as well as the things that we just left undone, as well as the things that we have done unconsciously. So an awful lot of our of human sin is in fact done at an unconscious level, it's not done consciously. So if we can sin that way, why can't animals? It's just a question. Um, the the um, primatologist Franz de Waal claims that chimpanzees stand, he says, at the threshold of planned, organized, intercommunity conflict. So he, um, he's one of the people that sort of hangs out with chimpanzees and observes them. And this is what he, this is his assessment of what's going on, that they can often be extremely nasty and almost deliberate and cooperate with each other in their going after other tribes of chimpanzees. So we don't know that. But it is at least a coherent question to ask when they do. And um, I, I would be inclined to say yes, and David Trump would be inclined to say yes. And so then we can ask the question well, what about animals in heaven? Once we've gone back, we've started to look at animals, we're trying to say um, you know, they're part of redemption. Does that mean that there will be animals you know, in the new heavens and the new earth? And I think we can say, say that, you know, in the the picture I showed you at the beginning of Michelangelo's Last Judgment had a lot of people going to damnation and as well as people going to, to heaven. And so the drama of salvation for humans for a long time was who was going to be saved and who wasn't. But in the 19th and 20th centuries, um, theologians like Schleiermacher and Barth were inching much more towards the sense of the universality of redemption for all people. But in other words, that the, you know, Whatever it was that Christ had come to do, Christ hadn't failed in doing that, and that all people were being gathered up into this redemptive um, process. And that clears the way, then, for the whole idea that other creatures might also be part of being gathered up into this new heavens and new earth. And if animals sin, then they need to be redeemed, because that's you know, what we're told that Jesus has come to do, is to redeem us from sin. Higher animals um, seem to suffer much as we do. I mean, none of them get rejection letters or get divorced or anything like that. But they do suffer, nevertheless. And they, you know, they, they have anxiety. They, they're predated in very um, particularly cruel ways. Um, so they, they have that. And, and if you're a chimpanzee, you actually do suffer, not exactly rejection letters or divorce, but you do suffer exclusion. From them, um, and you do de get demoted from your from your particular place and picking it. Um, so higher animals do suffer, <coughs> and um, so they we can at least sort of say that it makes sense to say that they are part of creation being folded into God's eternal purposes. And again, as we said before, Isaiah 11 and 65 are. The pictures, I mean, why is there a picture of all the animals lying down together in the peaceable kingdom if in fact that was not the intention of God that this be a part of the new heavens and new earth? Um, even in the past, Wesley, Aquinas, um, Jürgen Moltmann tentatively speak of animal redemption. And if we think about the interconnection of all life, um, if we are created to be in such, we now know, Intense um, connection to all the other animals on earth, then why would we not be in the new heavens and the new earth? So, um, Tanner says again clearly, something also happened to our mortal lives in and of themselves 
by virtue of life in God, post-mortem. In God, after its death, the world and everything it has ever contained may really receive as their own intrinsic properties the blessings of life in God that were perhaps always blocked in the pre-mortem world by forces of sin and death. And those forces are no more in God. Immortality may be a gift that creatures cannot receive in themselves with the lo loss of creaturehood, and therefore they may have it only in relation to God. Sorry, without loss of creaturehood, and therefore they may have it only in relation to God. So again, Catherine Tanner, not particularly doing eco-theology, but nevertheless um, her theology is tending towards a theology that does embrace the whole of creation being, being redeemed. Um, so then I just have a few so that's not going to stop, so any? Well, um, this is a conversation that you and I have had several times now, because maybe they opened up that conversation and developed a few themes that might get us somewhere. You pointed out the real problems in the, the theology of the fall and of original <coughs> sin as Augustine of Hippo developed it. And, and the problems are there never was the time of primordial innocence of the human race. It's taken us a lot longer to get to where we are than we thought and we're not on our own in terms of the drama of the mm -hmm. ocean. Yeah. And you developed a brilliant solution, I put at one conference I was at, this problem, you said, all theologians got favorite parts of the Bible, and what Augustine did was to put Genesis chapter three in on him for certain parts of Romans, and this is how he got to the doctrine he did. But supposing you put the book of Exodus in on him with Colossians and Ephesians, so the wandering of the children of Israel for 40 years with the desert, with repeated mistakes about trying to get on track with God, repeated wrong turnings, a much longer journey than was anticipated. This is a wonderful metaphor and image of um, our slow evolution of, you know, our, our crossing the threshold from at the various stages up through the evolutionary chain and the wrong turnings we've taken. And then in Colossians and Ephesians we have this image of Christ as Lord of the universe who's um, involved in the whole business of creation at every level and, and this is the, the high point of the creation. And when you look at it that way, you begin to get um, a theology of human development and, and why um, um, things have gone wrong for us at times. And I, I felt, felt that very persuasive. But of course, Augustine isn't the only major persuasive voice about trying to explain the problem of evil in human affairs or the fall. Take, for instance, Irenaeus, who you're right. Yeah, uh, no, I know. And he says to fall upwards. Yeah. If we remain innocent, we'd have been far less than we are. And that the fall opened up new possibilities for our development as human beings, our ethical consciousness, our, our path towards God, and that we have now, we've achieved a maturity we wouldn't have otherwise. And, and that, you know, a blessed fault, a happy, Fault, um, but this is the point of it all, that despite all the suffering and the wrong things. No, no, I totally agree, and I think that's why there has been a return to the Irenaean theology, because it is the only, I, I mean, I don't have time to show this, but that, that it's the only one that really makes sense if you're trying to have a non violent atonement, yep. and if you're trying to have um, a, a redemption that isn't plan B and that embraces the whole of creation. Yes. So I'm not saying, you know, that we're inventing. The re revisionism isn't necessarily inventing everything from yep. uh, new cloth. It's going back and finding these older images and being eclipsed, especially in the West. And that's where I was going to go yeah. next. Yeah. In fact, the doctrine of theosis as Eastern Orthodoxy has mm. developed, mm. It, which is now very popular in theological circles, mm. perhaps too popular. And this is the idea that God's intent on drawing all of the creation back to, to himself including the, the, um, the natural world as well. Mm. He always was interested that, in that. He didn't just see the animal creation as a backdrop to the drama of salvation. And here's my problem. People who like that doctrine like the animals, the bits of the creation that they like, cats and dogs mm -hmm. and pets. Mm -hmm. What about lice and scorpions mm -hmm. and snakes and the bits of creation we don't like mm -hmm. and we wouldn't want to see in the life of heaven and whose existence doesn't appear to have any point apart from being a damn nuisance to everybody because you're not a pain and suffering. Wouldn't one want to exclude massive parts of the creation in this drawing back exercise? I don't think that we can quite understand what it would be like if all forms of life were in some sort of loving symbiosis. And so, you know, the fact that we're not in this loving symbiosis with, you know, cockroaches and lice and other 
mosquitoes especially, not to mention sanitize them, yes. those things, um, doesn't mean that it isn't possible in another form of existence. And, you know, we don't know what is the use of mosquitoes and sanitize, but whenever we start to try and get rid of a species, we end up in all sorts of trouble, and even worse trouble. Um, so yes, we are, we, we're entangled with all these animals, but we're not entangled perfectly. And, and an awful lot of the evil in the world comes from this entanglement which is not um, satisfactory or perfect um, or mutually supportive because we live in this world which is imperfect and finite and all the individuals in it are different and they all have different reactions to mosquitoes and sandflies. And does that make sense? So that, so that in this sort of fallen world of wheat and tares, you know, growing along, yes. um, we're not going to actually be, we're going to be entangled, but we're not going to be entangled perfectly. But, uh, but you know, presumably there is a perfect state in the future where just as the wolf will lie down on the lamb, we will lie down. Well, that gets to my next topic, but there's a real ruthlessness in the whole business of evolution. And evolution is the engine that drives life on this planet, weeding out um, life forms that are uh, just not enough. We don't have to do that So, my point is that lions and tigers and other um, animals in creation, for whom hunting and killing is just an inbred part of their very identity, it's hard to imagine them without that in them, just as cutting into them. But that's why, that's why it's so extraordinary in fact that um, that's what the images are in Isaiah. I mean, and it is, it is, but on the other hand, I mean, there, there is, I mean, that, first of all, the, the evolutionary process isn't just nature but truth at all. I think it was described like that for a very long time, but now it will be described much more as dependent on very deep interconnections and mutual cooperation. Yes. So that's much more important than the nature of the world. But there obviously is, yes, very cruel predation, which is very hard to understand. And um, I can imagine lions being just wonderful without being predating, but I know some people can't. But um, but I think the whole point is that we can't quite understand it. Yes. Um, and that's, we can't understand a lot of things. We can't understand, you know, life after death. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that that. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, I think that's part of the sting of death, is that we can't see on with that. And as you can. Well, in fact, you've raised the most interesting issue of all in your lecture, and it's this. You've raised the issue of what's the threshold at which animals move to being like human beings? And you've offered some real clues, you know, that we use tools, dexterity, a kind of flexibility in intellectual operations. And um, the really intriguing thing you've opened up for me, I'm someone who's not really switched on the animal creation, is that God would lose interest in the human race because of our destructive tendencies and our um, rapacious natures and bring on dolphins or chimpanzees or elephants, which are, as you say, quite close to the threshold. And parrots. And yes, and to take them as the parent, select one of them to be the chosen one. That's a really intriguing possibility to open up to you all say. I once asked a, a very famous technologist in London uh, where the line should be drawn between animal and human. And uh, I got a very interesting answer. Uh, he said, when we dig up uh, ancient fossils, uh, the thing to look for is a fossil with a heel bone. Because when you have a fossil with a heel bone, it must have been looked after. And that's where he put, where he chose to draw the line between animal and human. And I thought that was rather, rather a very, well, in fact, an extremely carefully thought out answer to my question. The thing is that there are a lot of different answers, and that is an interesting one, and that pushes it back quite far. It pushes it back a long way. It pushes it back a very long way. And so then the next question is, mm -hmm. Are there different thresholds? And is what happened when we started representing art and caves and you know okra on bodies and things and things, is that a different threshold? And so I think that's another question that paleontologists and anthropologists are asking. Is, is, is there more than one threshold? You know, and, and did the did the Neanderthal 
pass one threshold, because the other threshold was, I can't spell, you know, say, standing upright. <laughs> and that happened very early, um, you know, not, not long after a million years ago. So, and that's when we started to have the very fast you know, neurolinguistic interactions that you get in face to face with someone. And, um, and that was obviously a threshold. Well, this is not to say that there's other things you possibly haven't thought of. It's just that what could happen would typically take a message of Colossians very seriously and, and Christ is Lord of the universe and a kind of evolving couple of forms of life is that several of these life forms could cross the threshold and we would have to live in symphonic harmony with them because they would now have the capacities. Read the sparrows, two sentences. You say that now because of the Yes, yes, that's right. Uh, the concealing it very well. Well, except that, except oh, that, that human, human beings um, did, I mean, we lived without any material culture for a long time, presumably. And so, yes, I mean, if, if you look at the elements, for example, I mean, it's a company that have an extraordinary range of sounds, you know, and people who hang out with them are sure that they're conversing with each other. And they live very long lives, and they have very long periods of grief when an element dies. So yes, I mean maybe in fact elephants have crossed some sort of threshold, but they're not nearly as nasty as they are. In fact, they're almost perfect creatures. And so, I mean, the thing about us, of course, is that in some sense we know good and evil in a way in which other animals don't. But the other thing is that you know we have dexterity which enables us to do all sorts of things with our intelligence and perhaps then feeds back in some sort of feedback loop, increasing our intelligence. You know, elements really are a bit limited when it comes to you know, making stone tools and things like that. So, yeah, yeah I mean, it's, well, we don't know what's going on in dolphins' heads and, and, and elephants' heads at all. And we're learning a lot more, and the more we learn, the more we realise that we have pitiful, you know, um, understanding before. But we do seem to do things like this, you know, which other animals are not doing at the moment. But who knows? <laughs> oh, yeah. Different. There was yeah. a cartoon in private eye mm -hmm. that I was looking at in there, which had um, these two scientists experimenting with rats, and they had said that this, well, this is this, the nth time we have done this experiment with these rats, and they've mm -hmm. all died, so the system, and what we're trying to do is not working. Mm -hmm. So they, just, they took the last rat out and dropped him in the rubbish bin. And as soon as, as, soon as the man the scientists had gone back inside, the, the rat jumped out and went away. They learnt already mm -hmm. how to escape. Well, yes, I mean, extraordinary intelligence, some of these, some of these creatures. Yeah. And a sense of justice as well. You know, you, um, if you reward one monkey with <coughs> a cucumber and another one in the grave, and the, um, one's going to get a cucumber with a ballistic. So, Yes, and quite advanced theory of mind in the sense that they, um, they, have, a, they have a theory about what other animals are doing, you know, that kind of stuff. So the more we look, the more they have. Yeah. It's very interesting. Yeah. It is one of the marks of us having crossed the threshold when we're talking about the um, mm -hmm. um Lord of theologians who are driving over, um, is it yes. Gregerson, and he talks about Christ as a praying animal. Is, is that capacity for a life with God, a literacy life with God, one of the key distinguishing points for us now? It doesn't rule out that other parts of the immigration might develop later on. Well, as far as we know, I mean, for that we seem to think, we think, you know, we need symbolic language and symbolic meaning for the animals. And I think we can
Jag är dig. You know, you, you don't talk about reincarnation, the Buddhist view. In some respects, it seems almost to be a more logical explanation of a lot of things that you talk about. Um, it's just totally perplexing to me, as far as I'm concerned, that anybody can actually state anything definitive about this particular subject. The important thing is to have an open mind, surely, rather than go forward with a set of doctrinal um, directions which you should abide to in order to gain resurrection. Well, I, I mean, I, I hope I wasn't sort of being too dogmatic. I was um, saying, though, that certain sorts of dogma from the past have blinded us to the natural world. And that that then puts the rest of the animal world and animals on the agenda, the theological agenda. And so what I was doing then was saying, well, no, when you put them on the agenda, these are some of the things you might think, some of the things you might wonder. But, you know, I mean, I agree, you can't sort of, you can't come up with any absolute answers at all. That's part of the, the wonder of it. You could just try to go deeper into the whole biology and anthropology of what it is that makes us human and on the same side, that on the other side, deeper into the theology and see what happens. And yeah, so I'm certainly not sort of saying one has to now understand the fall this way or one has to understand redemption this way. Only that in the West especially, our understanding of redemption has cut us off from the natural world. And that we need some sort of revisioning of it, which is in part a reimagination in light of what we know, but it's also a part, a kind of part, as Hugh says, um, going back and looking at the tradition and seeing that there are other more useful ways of understanding things like the fall. Um, which I didn't go into because it was time, but yeah. But of course it's not all bad. I mean, the point about the doctrine of original sin is it trying to explain the existence of evil and an inbuilt self-destructive tendencies in the human nature, which does seem to be deeply embedded. And that's one thing that God has to deal with in order to bring us uh, into a relationship with harmony and so forth. Yes, and I, 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 I would agree that I also think that um, the given what chimpanzees are like, that we probably crossed, crossed the species threshold somewhat um, with tendencies already to selfishness and to aggression in the wrong circumstances. And, and we do know that you know, the human beings will be a lot more aggressive in very straightened circumstances and will live much more at peace if, you know, if things are going well and society is more organized. So it's not that we absolutely have to be violent all the time, but we do have this tendency in the wrong circumstances to violence. But he was also a master psychologist who began the inward journey to explain the unconscious factors that make us good or bad. And, um, yeah, yeah. and, and have a very acute understanding of what makes human beings tick the good or the And many people have talked about original sin, for example, as being that everybody is born into a sort of situation where the institutions are not right, where there is discord, where I mean, just that, because that is the human condition, and anyone being born into that situation will then perpetuate, perpetuate some of that in, in other ways. And I mean, you're right, there, there are sort of like you know, genetic reasons for that as well. Um, and so that can be a part of what we mean by original sin if we're trying to reformulate it, taking into consideration a, you know, a, um, a sort of scientific understanding. And process theology, which of course is another whole issue, um, in the 20th century, it did an awful lot of that. It did an awful lot of trying to sort of understand how we could re-understand something like original sin in terms of these sort of cycles, destructive structural cycles that human beings born into. But all of that is just a conversation. It's not saying that anyone has to think that way. 
So that once you start to bring these things into dialogue with one another, you get quite interesting conversations. I think. Why well, call it sin? Why not call it reproduction, which is essential to our ongoing existence? I always, maybe it's my opinion, but I always thought that sin was being bad, something bad you did. And uh, you had to be taught which, what was good and what was bad. And yet we go back to sin which Adam and Eve. They committed original sin, doing what comes naturally, you might say. Um, that, to me, is very perplexing. That whether or not they have therefore changed the structures of reality is, is what, we're, what we're arguing about here. I mean, we don't really know, you know, who the first people were, but they're not they're not going to have done the kinds of things that Adam and Eve um, were said to have done that sort of trained, changed the structures of the world so that there was so that all of a sudden there was death and all of a sudden there was there were tsunamis and all of a sudden it was, you know, disease. Um, yes, I mean, human beings, because of our extraordinary intelligence, we can cooperate with evil as well as good. And so, yes, you know, right from the beginning, there would have been some forms of aggression and, and you know, and, and magnified forms of aggression and, and envy and things like that. But but not in such a way as to make a radical change of what went before in the very fabric of, of life. You know, there was disease before, there was aggression before, there was envy before, before humans came along. And um, if we understand what humans are at all, I think we can say that that then got magnified enormously because of the particular kinds of intelligence that we have. But we don't know exactly when that happened. There are, many, there are many anthropologists that will argue that, in fact, human aggression was very low, at a very low level of hunter-gatherer societies, and that it didn't become the problem that it has become until agriculture and the Neolithic period, when all of a sudden we had to defend land and we had to do, you know, have property and ownership and all those sorts of things. I mean, so that's a very interesting theory. When we were just wandering around in the tribes, in fact, we, we were not as aggressive as we are. Well, there's the existence of radical evil, and we have to explain and deal with it by being as calm, old pot, and adult hippo. But somehow, this is more than just um, tough environmental factors to come to this kind of thing. Oh, I would yes. <laughs> not everybody. <laughs> Can we come back to your point? Are you saying that the point this guy was making to you is that some parts of the animal creation have shown the capacity to nurse each other, um, um, heal each other? No, he was saying, he was saying, that, he was saying exactly this is what. He was saying the transition from early animal to something beginning to move in the direction we call human was the existence of compassion and a willingness to uh, carry the person with a broken leg and uh, split it and, and at the very least feed the person while he recovered. Right. Um, uh, his point was that if you were if you were a creature in the rainforest and you broke your leg, well that was bad luck. And that was the end. Because that was just the way it was. Or um, Orangutan who fall with Martha's regularity out of the forest, trees, break a leg. Well, that's the end of that. So, um, who was that? Who was it? Uh, no, you asked me to remember something, so okay. okay. And that's, I haven't got the chance to keep it. Okay, that's right. Um, yeah. So, I mean, again, it's, there's continuity, isn't there? Because elephants will show great compassion. They will go to great lengths to, to help a fellow elephant in distress. Obviously they can't experience splints on, on the leg, but you know, there is a measure to, to, to their capabilities of compassion going on there. I strongly suspect that the perfect human being mm -hmm. was born at the time of the, uh, 
a number of your colleagues on Jesus and talking about the, the animal human being. Um, uh, with all the right things about compassion and all the rest of it. Uh, was born somewhere in uh, what's now Uganda, um, wiped out 100,000 years ago by his mates who weren't quite there yet. <laughs> and it could be in the end of that because they were wiped out. Well, exactly. Yes, yes. exactly. Yes, although they were, not, they were further north than you get it. But well, I think we'll draw it from a close there. Um, I could just say that I remember one of the conferences you um, brought together, there was a, a really entertaining part of one of your, your guest lecturers wanted to put an icebreaker and start his lecture, and he suggested that since the North Pole is dissolving and uh, won't exist soon, all the polar bears should be loaded onto a merchant freighter and brought down to the Antarctic to save the species. And I remember the outraged and enraged response this drew from several of the conference participants who said, uh, did he not realise that polar bears navigate by the stars? The result would be that these lost creatures would blunder around on the edge of the ice cap, wiping out penguin um, colonies as they moved across the ice cap, and then tumbling into the sea themselves to die. So I think there's um, an enduring memory of one of these sites. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for initiating this very stimulating conversation, which has certainly advanced my understanding of where what salvation might mean for all of creation as well, as we face competition from the other um, parts of the animal creation back across the threshold of the end of the agreement of God's grace. Thank you. Thank you.